constructed in this case. And uh, this is also published in this first paper. So numerical tests, we uh, provide numerical tests first for the nonlinear case in a two dimensional situation. And uh, 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 here is uh, this uh, Dirac's potential. This is the nonlinear function f of u. And this is the right hand side. And uh, so we introduce parameter alpha, that is epsilon square omega. Uh, OK, this is the homogenized equation, and its solution is denoted v. The solution of uh, the original equation is called u. This is v. And we also introduce uh, the equation without potential, and its solution is called w. So here you see the potential is epsilon. So here is uh, the picture that shows that uh, in the case when alpha is small, alpha is epsilon square omega, then uh, the uh, solution to the original problem is very close to the solution of uh, the homogeneity equation. This uh, slightly blue line is uh, uh, the solution of the problem without potential. And you see that it's uh, completely uh, different. Now, this is the case when alpha is equal to 1. Then we can distinguish uh, this violet line that is the exact solution. This dark blue line that is the homogenized solution it is still relatively close and this is the solution without potential and this is the situation when alpha is 900 then you see that again this is uh, the solution of the homogenized equation violet line is the exact solution and uh, where you see these peaks, uh, it means that uh, here there are uh, the cells. So out of some part of the cells, uh, this solution is uh, becomes closer to uh, the solution of uh, the equation without potential. And uh, uh, we also had numerical tests in 3D, but for linear setting. And uh, uh, here we introduce parameter beta. That is, uh, that is epsilon power, uh, epsilon multiplied by omega one over six. And alpha is still, uh, still the same as it was before. And so uh, here, with this right hand side, we consider again u as the solution of the original problem, uh, v the solution of the problem with homogenized potential, and the problem without potential, which solution is called w. So this is the case when alpha is small and beta is also small. And we see that almost coincide the solutions of the original problem and the homogenized one. And now two pictures <clears throat> when beta is equal to one and the alpha, of course, is very big. So we see explicitly that the solution tends to the solution of the problem without potential out of some spaces where you see these peaks, the peaks correspond to the presence of the cells. So where the, the cells are there, there is no, it is not close to the problem without potential and out 
it is closed. This is beta equal one and beta equal two. The same, ten, uh, the same trend can be uh, seen. So uh, it means that, uh, in fact, uh, firstly, uh, if we want to model uh, the set, the array of the cells with the help of multidimensional delta function functions, it is better to inter to approximate these de delta functions by uh, this uh, piecewise constant coefficient q that is big uh, equal to omega big parameter on the cells and equal to zero out of cells but keeping the integral equal to one uh, and uh, secondly that we can homogenize this problem if epsilon square omega is small parameter and we cannot if it is not the case also we can uh, propose an answer on what to do if only partially we can uh, we have this uh, condition respected and in the other part it is not respected then we can just formally homogenize it in the part where this condition is respected and leave the problem as it is there where uh, the a homogenization, homogenization is impossible. And in this case, uh, we can uh, prove also that uh, the, there is a, a good approximation of the exact solution by a partially homogenized problem. Of course, when it is partially homogenized, then we make, in some sense, zoom in the part where we cannot homogenize. And this part should be, should not be too uh, large. If not uh, numerically, uh, it will be very expensive to compute. So uh, uh, it's all that I wanted to present. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Gregory, for this uh, very interesting presentation. And I would like to uh, invite our listeners to ask questions. There are two possibilities. Either you raise hand or you can ask questions in the chat. Uh, and uh, waiting for the questions, I'd like to say that, uh, of course, I am familiar with this work, but still I would like to uh, stress its importance because uh, very often when we study biological problems, we write our models empirically, phenomenologically, without thinking too much about their mathematical justification. But from uh, what Grigori explained us, we see that sometimes this justification can work, but sometimes it doesn't work. So it can be really very important to, at least sometimes, to, to try to do this justification. And of course, this study has many, many possible generalizations and open questions. We discussed some of them, some other remain still open. One of the questions which I'm really uh, very much interested and intrigued, uh, we discussed it a little bit, but it wasn't finished, that in the study presented by Grigori, uh, the Mm, there is a condition on the sign of this nonlinearity of the, this consumption or production function. So the question which remains open is what happens is the sign is variable. So Gregory, could you please comment on this question? Uh, unfortunately, no comment because uh, <laughs> uh, this uh, this uh, condition uh, it. Uh, ensures the monotonicity of uh, the uh, original problem that allows us to prove the existence uh, and uniqueness. Without existence and uniqueness theorem, we can prove nothing. Uh, but uh, of course, if it, it changes uh, uh, sign, but not uh, drastically, uh, so that uh, 
uh, it is only small deviation, then we can uh, employ the uh, Banach principle, uh, contracting principle arguments, and then we can do something. Right. Yes, Alexey, Alexey Tokarev has a question. Alexey, you can go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, Grigory, could you please clarify? Uh, you mean uh, in your uh, 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 task that uh, the substance is assumed to consume uh, everywhere uh, where the cell is? Yes. So, yeah, so inside the cell. But uh, if we think about uh, geometry, well, uh, uh, well, more uh, biological meaning will be if we assume that the substance consumes as the boundary of the cells. Yes, so yes. It is everywhere between the cells, and there is that somehow flux to the to the cell, which is proportional to the concentration of the substance on the boundary. So uh, does it change uh, this approach? Uh, much, or it will be varied in this. Uh, no, no. I I think of course that this uh, your model that you uh, explain, uh, it is uh, more physical, more corresponding to a real life. So that uh, that in fact uh, this uh, delta-like function, it should be concentrated on the surface of the ball. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that um, uh, that if uh, this is, I, I I I cannot answer with with proofs, but I think that uh, uh, that if uh, the, this uh, surface uh, so p u is equal to some constant at the surface, that if uh, global uh integra integrally it it is the uh, the same then uh, the result should be similar also mm -hmm. there will be this condition epsilon square omega uh just uh, another definition uh of uh, delta like function uh, if i can i i would i would uh, like also to comment on this question so if you consider two dimensional case right and our cells uh, a layer of cells of cells is lying on the plane, right? Alexey, you understand what I mean? Yes, yes, yes. We yes. have three-dimensional we have three-dimensional cells which are uh, uh, at some surface. So the projection is two-dimensional. Yes. So these cells they consume these nutrients from their surface. But if you consider this two-dimensional projection, it will be exactly uh, these circles inside these two-dimensional cells. Do you understand what I mean? I, I see, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, you see? Mm -hmm. So in two-dimensional setting, these two formulations are equivalent. Mm -hmm. But, okay, there will be some uh, projection Correction function, but I think it is of the order of one, so it doesn't matter. Yes, I see. Okay. Uh, uh, as a last remark, because we have limited time, and so the last remark I would like to say is that these conditions Grigory presented that this convergence takes place under some conditions on these parameters, small parameters, and large parameters, and these parameters are related to the size of the cells and to this consumption rate. So I didn't think about that before, but it's a, what I just saw during the presentation, that it would be interesting to think about the meaning of these conditions from the biological point of view. So we have size of cells and consumption rate, and we have some conditions on these two parameters. In fact, biologically speaking, we have some condition on the consumption rate of nutrients by cells. So it is interesting to see whether these conditions has some biological meaning. Well, unfortunately, we have to stop this uh, interesting discussion now, and I would like to announce a short change in the program. In fact, we begin our session on nonlinear dynamics, and we changed the order of two talks. So the first talk 
in this session will be by Sergei Petrovsky and the sec second talk by Arnaud Zucro. So we start the session. Grigory, could you please stop sharing the screen? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, Sergey, you can show now your slides. Just give me one second. Can you see it now? Yes, we see the, the slides. If you can show also the full screen, it will be even better. Yep, yep. I'm going to do that. <coughs> yes, very good. And please, at the bottom, you see this height. It's written height there. If you push on that height. Uh -huh. Okay, very good. So we begin our session on nonlinear dynamics. It's, it's a great pleasure for me to announce our first speaker, Sergei Petrovsky from the University of Leicester. And Sergei will tell us about long transients and population dynamics. Please, Sergei, you can begin your presentation. Thank you very much, Vitaly. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you to all organizers for inviting me. So what I'm going to to do uh, precisely is I will start with some introduction to describe what is their phenomenon, let's say, and then I will give a sort of review of their basic mechanisms that generates this uh, uh, phenomenon or um, behavior in a non-spatial system as a sort of baseline case. And then um, I think after that, I will have only very little time remaining. So I will have a brief look at spatial systems, how this long transient look at spatial systems, and then we'll end up with some conclusions, of course. Uh, so um, now, what is it all about, right? So when we think about transients, uh, we usually intuitively expect to be something rather short, or relatively short. And it, it, it actually goes from the whole meaning of the word. Uh, yeah, so transient is, uh, by definition, is something lasting only for a short time. Uh, and in, in mathematical terms, for instance, if uh, a, a non-spatial system starts uh, initial conditions our way in the basin of uh, a tractor or steady state, for simplicity, stable steady state, then what we normally expect is uh, some exponentially fast convergence to the steady state. Right? And the long-term dynamics is associated with that particular steady state or more generally with that tractor. So long transient actually sounds like an oxymoron, but but it's not really so. And now I would like to show you a few examples before proceeding to more general mathematical formulations. Uh, so that's uh, the dynamics uh, of a model, a very simple time discrete non-spatial single species model. So a single time discrete equation, a single map. Right, and the vertical axis shows the variable, the population size, and uh, the horizontal axis shows generations, meaning discrete time, in fact. And what you see here, it, uh, there is no convergence, so you cannot see convergence uh, of initial conditions. I suppose they were chosen somewhere appropriately, so that it's already on there, what looks like an attractor, right? But, uh, and this, this runs for a long time, so for about 140 generations or something like that. <laughs> but interestingly, if you run the system for a little longer, say for another 10 or 15 units, what's happening is this. So without any warning, the system just uh, goes to zero. And this is this is genuine dynamics, I should say, yeah, because people would often think, okay, something from the numerical procedure. There is numerical procedure is okay. There is no any approximation. It's a time discrete system. It's just straightforward to simulate, right? So what we, what we see here, it's change of the dynamics. We had, for a long time, we had something that looked like sustainable, rather, rather complex, actually chaotic dynamics, and then suddenly it goes to zero. So change of dynamics, change of um, regime, if you want. So another example is here, and it's a different system. So it's now a time continuous, still single species, single equation, 
uh, now with time delay and a similar situation. So now we have uh, this usual convergence, fast convergence from the initial condition. So after some oscillations, it starts looking like uh, stabilized, looks like a limit cycle, periodic oscillations. Anyway, so then, so we, we, we may as well recall how it was 30 years ago, right? When computers are not as powerful as now. So one, one pe people who would run this system, they will simply stop calculations, stop simulations at this occasion. Clearly what's happening, right? This periodical dynamics. But now we have a chance to run it for longer and then what's happening is precise, it's entirely different, right? So starting from a certain moment, a different dynamics, a different regime starts emerging and eventually what's happening is something entirely different. Okay, not entirely, it's still periodical oscillations, but with a, a very different average and different period as well. And this is the asymptotic dynamics. That, that can be checked for running for much, much longer, okay? So that's, uh, uh, so the, in this particular figure, you see one, once again, what, what is the difference? So that would be the usual, so to say, transient fast convergence to something that looks like a sustainable long curve of asymptotical dynamics, but this only, what, what's happening here in the midterm only mimics the asymptotical dynamic, but not actually is the asymptotic. And then we have a transition, usually a rather relatively uh, short time period before the system goes to another, and that can be the real asymptote. Okay. So then, uh, last example. So now it's a bit more complicated. So now it's three species model, something to do with quantum dynamics, uh, space time continuous. And again, what we see so after starting with some initial conditions, uh, after some relatively short period of apparent convergence to what looks like sustainable dynamics, chaotic, spatial temporal chaos in this case. But once again, if you run it for a little longer, what's happening is this. Without warning, or almost without warning, the system actually collapses and goes down to zero, to extinction. And of course, I should mention, most importantly, that the, all the parameters are constant. The system in all three cases, and there are many more, in fact, the system is autonomous. There is no explicit dependence on time. So what's happening here, this change of the regime, uh, it's entirely due, due to internal system properties, due to internal dynamics, okay? It's, there's no force. So that's models. Uh, similar things, in fact, happens in nature. There is an ample number of observations. There are similar things happening. So two of them are shown here. So um, the first one is observation on the floor beetle in a laboratory. Uh, and again, uh, so the population, uh, the number of larvae in this case, that's what it looks like. So that would be the initial condition. We see some sort of, uh, again, which looks like convergence and then the system apparently stabilizes on a, what, again, what looks like a, a small amplitude limit cycle probably, right? And in another case, um, that would be the field observation, so field data on some fish population. So then the system uh, experienced some small oscillations, but not too far away from, from extinction. In fact. So their species survives, so manage, manages to survive at some low population uh, size. And that looks pretty stable, pretty consistent. But then again, if you have more observations, then what's happening is this. Right. And in both cases, it's striking difference, of course. So we have a clear change of regime. We have, uh, 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 so what, what actually actually happened before, so what I showed you previously was actually a transient, but a long transient, okay? So um, now trying to do some sort of for more formal analysis, so more mathematics now coming in. So um, how that at all can be possible, right? Because as I said, there is no, uh, no any explicit dependence on time. So um, it's, all, it's, all, it's all entirely internal dynamics of the system. So how can it be possible in the sense, uh, uh, what are the uh, system structure or system functional properties, whatever that could uh, possibly uh, result in a phenomenon like that? And then of course, another question, a related question is actually, how long is long? What actually we mean by the long trends, right? Um, and I would like to start with the uh, second question. So how long is long? What exactly we call a long transient? So first uh, property of that 
let's say, phenomenon is that it actually mimics the asymptotical dynamics. So in the cases I showed you at the beginning, it was either uh, uh, chaos or uh, um, apparently some sort of periodical dynamics. Uh, so something that, or it could be as well steady state, I didn't show that, but it could be just a steady state, something that we normally often have as an asymptotical dynamic. But that's not actually asymptotic, so it's only run for a finite time, where this finite time, in fact, playing with the controlling parameter by changing the controlling parameter can be made infinitely long. So more precisely, it means that a system or if the system, if a system has a bifurcation at a certain value uh, for the controlling parameter, let's say PC. So then uh, as long as their parameter value approaches closely this critical bifurcation value, their lifespan of the transients goes to infinity. That's what we, defined as a long transient mathematically. Now let's let's have a look how it can be possible. Still, what are the main structures for that? And um, so we, I'm saying we because uh, there was a few, quite a few collaborators for that. So um, we identified three basic mechanisms, how long transients emerge in a non-spatial system in particular, non-spatial case. And the simplest and most general one perhaps is uh, the effect of a saddle, saddle point, right? So as you see it here, so this is the phase plane of the hypothetical two species model. So A is the steady state, a saddle, and uh, that would be some typical trajectories, right? And then clearly, if you start with the initial conditions chosen somewhere close to the, sufficiently close to the attracting manifold, the flow of the system will bring you to a close vicinity of the cell. And since the saddle is, a steady point, steady state, uh, uh, even that it's unstable, of course, right? The system, the flow will be very slow in this vicinity. And that's that the system spent a considerable time there. So that can be, of course, um, can be um, considered more, more, more rigorously, right? So we just uh, take, uh, take any general or generic population dynamics model. If it has a steady state, a saddle type, we linearize the system, then the system is, uh, usually a combination of exponents. And then of, if, if we take the exponent with the largest uh, eigenvalue, then this eigenvalue gives you the scale or the time scale over which the changes happen in the small vicinity of the cell, right? So from here, we derive this uh, estimate of the duration of the transit, like inverse uh, of uh, lambda one. So um, in case of the saddle, a real part is not needed. In case of the saddle, uh, of course, they're both real. Anyway, it's inverse largest eigenvalue. Okay, so, and uh, that's important because uh, first thing, it gives an idea about what we call scaling. So how the duration of the transient may depend on the parameters. So, so it's inverse dependence, like one over uh, uh, something in the, in the power minus one. And this, uh, that's actually appears to be typical. And the uh, second is that that's what we see here. Once, la once the largest eigenvalue, positive eigenvalue approaches becoming small and small, approaches zero. So which of course means uh, a bifurcation, right? That duration goes to, uh, eventually goes to infinity. So it corresponds to the definition that I showed you a few moments ago. So um, now that's what is interesting here. That can be observed, I mean, saddle point, never mind this linearization, consider directly from the linear system. So then you see that actually this long transients obviously is a property of a linear system. But in case of a linear system, it's rather exotic because of course to see this sort of dynamics, you have to start somewhere very close to that attracting manifold. Otherwise the flow will take you, uh, uh, will take the system far away, somewhere here, sufficiently far away from the saddle. You will not see the effect of the, of the slowing down. So, but if we consider a nonlinear system, then of course, uh, it can, it's more complicated and that's where it can become more common or more uh, um, more explicit, right? And uh, one important case, should I say also typical case as, 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 as I will show it in, 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 uh, in a moment. So what, what may happen is that close to the saddle point, we may have a, uh, a separatrix. Separatrix that divides the field of flow so that now if we start some way here, so now it's not the range of initial conditions it must not necessarily be close to the attracting manifold, but somewhere here, because in this case, the flow, the whole flow from this can be quite a broad range 
it's sort of channeled, it's sort of channeled through the narrow channel and is brought as long as separatrix is close to the saddle, is brought to the small vicinity of the saddle. And in this case, there, uh, there, um, this long train and dynamics becomes more common and uh, more explicit. One specific example, specific but quite common, this is um, what is shown here is a classical prey predator model. In ecology, they also often call it Rosenweig Macarthur model. So U is prey, so logistic growth, V is predation, so this term describes predation. This uh, that we grow for predator, this mortality of predator. And this uh, system is uh, <coughs> the system is known to uh, have limit cycle in their certain in a certain parameter range when their second as the client crosses the hump of the first as a client. I'm omitting the details here. What is important is that. The size of the limit cycle depends on K, which has the meaning of, it's a parameter, but has the meaning of K capacity. So then when K grows, the limit cycle also grows and approaches very closely to steady state, uh, to the region, which is the steady state, which is the saddle. And there is another saddle point here, right? So we have in this case, the limit cycle that comes very closely to these two saddles. And that's exactly the situation that I showed here, right? That would be the limit cycle. Right, and the flow which can start, let's say, anywhere, anywhere here would be channeled through a very narrow channel and brought very close to the origin, and then eventually to the other saddle point, so that the dynamic will look like that. Right? It will be an alteration of very long stretches where systems stay in, in, in the vicinity of one or the other, in the vicinity of extinction state like that, and then after relatively fast transition, for another long period of time in the vicinity of the second second saddle point. So, and that will happen indefinitely, right? And what is important with, with the increase, with the further increase in K, the duration of each of the transients, this at the upper steady state and this at the lower steady state, they will both grow to infinity, eventually. right? So, um, <coughs> so this uh, is, uh, that looks actually like a rather specific case because uh, we have the, saddle points uh, boundary steady states, right? So it's either complete extinction, zero point here, or extinction of the predator. But it's it's not a necessary condition because with some reasonable generalization of the model, which actually makes it more, more ecologically relevant, like in, including early effect for prey, or some sort of threshold effect who, uh, for those who never seen this uh, term before, and quadratic mortality for predator, then what, what's happening, the limit cycle and the saddle point can actually be in the interim of the first uh, uh, quarter of the play, right? So in this case, the long transient instead of, or, instead of origin would be somewhere close to a positive steady state. And another generalization, perhaps more interesting, that in a more complicated system consisting of not two, but uh, three or more equations, we may have several saddles and that saddles can be connected and connected by some heteroclinic connection. Uh, a simple, simplest example uh, well known in ecology is what is called May Leonard system. So system of three competing species and they're in their phase space of the system uh, uh, in a broad, let's say broad parameter range. We have exactly like this, three steady states, one each of the states corresponding to only single species surviving, other two go accepting and then What's happening in this or similar case, so this is a sketch, of course. Um, so the trajectory starting somewhere sufficiently close to one of the attracting manifolds or one of the saddles, then could be could be following this heteroclinic connection, meaning they have a succession of the long quasi long transients, like quasi steady states, first staying close here for a long while, then standing here for a long while, then again here, and so on, right? Or maybe coming back if it's a, a heteroclinic loop. So this uh, this is regarded as um, uh, by except for application to population dynamics. This is also regarded, by the way, as a conceptual model of climate change. So there are more details for this in this paper by Peter Ashwin and Marcus Tim. Right. So that was the first mechanism, saddle point. Now something else. A second mechanism, which is called ghost attractor, so or the effect of the ghost attractor. So what it means is that um, let's consider this uh, case, pretty generic. In fact, again, uh, uh, let's focus on the two-dimensional case or so two equations, two variables, that's the phase plane. 
So let's assume that the isoclines of the system has this shape here, concave against convex, right? Which means that in a certain parameter H, they would have two intersection points here and here, and then we have intersection with the trivial part of the isoclines. Isoclines. So in this case, we have two stable steady states shown by the green dots. Yeah, so here low one, and then this upper one, and between them would be a saddle point. That looks like a lot of assumptions, but in fact it isn't because it, this is a pretty general situation for many different systems. So now then what happens is if we change a the value of a parameter, let's say parameter P controlling one, then what might happen, the black as a client would move to the right or and or the blue as a client would move to the left so that eventually they start sort of slipping one out of the other. So these two points, saddle point and this upper, uh, uh, upper state, steady state would move towards each other. So eventually they would merge, something like that. And then the two separate rigs will, will go apart eventually, right? So something like that. But and then in this parameter range where the parameter controlling parameter would be just slightly above its bifurcation value so that the difference between the two, the two other clients would be very small. So creating again, a sort of a very narrow channel. Then what's happening is whatever is the flow far away from this part of the phase plane, when the system comes close to here, it slows down. It slows down because it's it's a narrow channel between two other clients and the system will still, this is a local bifurcation, right? But the global structure is the same. So the, the flow goes here and then slows down like it, like it was before the bifurcation. Here. So which means that the system can, sort of hang on in the empty space. There is no steady state, but the system can slow down tremendously and spend a very long while in this area of the phase space before shooting away for somewhere else for another, for the real attractor or something like that, okay? So then altogether it happens like that. If we, if we now consider what can be the dependence of uh, those variables U and V as a function of time, so that will be there. Uh, let's say we have the initial condition, then the phase flow, uh, phase flow of the system will take to the narrow channel, right? To the vicinity of what was the steady state value, this V star before the bifurcation, when we did have the stable steady state. But then after it disappeared, after, bifurc after the bifurcation, it will be hanging around for a long while before shooting down and going somewhere. In this case, it will be. And in fact, it is possible to show that the scaling, again, it's a sort of power law, inverse power law. So in this case, it scales with the difference between the value of P and the verification value as inverse square root, right? So, um, okay, for this ghost attractor, I'm talking to give, to introduce you to this, uh, to this idea. I, 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 I'm focusing on uh, uh, their steady state, but it can be much more complicated and in fact, uh, uh, a, a very interesting object that is observed in many different systems is called chaotic ghost. Chaotic ghost, meaning that the system where in some parameter range we had a coexistence, a sort of by stability, coexistence of the chaotic dynamics, then would be some sort of separatrix here. And then let's say in this case, periodic dynamics for this particular system, right? Then when you, when the parameter passes the bifurcation value, uh, there is a sort of boundary crisis here. So this uh, boundary disappears, so the two basins merge. But again, this is a more local bifurcation. Yeah? It happens at the boundary between the two basins, right? So the bulk of chaotic attractor, the topological structure, most of it is still there, which means the system, if the system starts at the chaotic attractor, it will spend a very long time here before leaving it and going to periodical dynamics, which is the real assumption. And for chaotic transients, in fact, uh, their scaling is different. And in fact, they can be even longer than a simple thing. Right, so that's just uh, one example that I showed you at the beginning that how it looks in case of chaotic ghost. So that was not really sustainable chaos, not real chaos, but a ghost of it, right? So then the system left it and eventually goes to zero. So now uh, I have to speed up. I think I'm very aware of time. <clears throat> So slow fast, the third generic mechanism is called slow fast systems. Slow fast systems means we have a small parameter in at least one of the equations, right? Again, the baseline case of two species, we can interpret U as prey, V as predator, but it's really not necessary, it's more generic. What is important is that the second part of the second equation, second in this case can be first, multiplied by a small parameter, right? 
And then it can be used just like that, or we can introduce this rescale time and write it differently. And for any finite value of epsilon, non-zero value of epsilon, it's of, it's of course equivalent, it's just sort of algebraic transformation. But in the limit of uh, epsilon coming to zero, this system turns into two different limiting systems. Their uh, slow system here, they're usually called slow system because they describe slow part of the dynamics and this is called fast system. So now, unfortunately, I cannot spend any more time on that. It's, it's an interesting topic and uh, would deserve more time, but there is not enough time for that. So what's happening, how it looks in the reality. So for the predator prey system where we have a limit cycle, how now it transforms, right? It looks like that. So we have the change, the shape of the cycle changes somehow. It's becoming less smooth, you can say so. So we almost have some sort of angles here, here, and here. And then it consists of parts of their slow dynamics when the system moves along the Isaac line, here down and here slowly up. And then it changes to fast changes of prey, fast here and fast here. All right, so that corresponds to the fast dynamics and uh, as a function of time, it would look like that, right? So for, 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 um, for instance, for prey, especially you can see it, okay, that's, this part is relatively slow, but eventually it accelerates, right? And then it drops down and then it remains at a very close, very small values, very close to zero, but not zero, right? For a long time, and that can be made much longer. It depends on epsilon, of course, right? And then it fast shoots up and then another period and like that. So it's not necessarily periodic. So it can be just a single instance of uh, this and that. So this is another example. So a competition system, two species competition system starting here. So in a not generated system where epsilon is on the order of one, what would happen is like that system will go. In this case, only one species can survive, right? Uh, the other one loses and goes to extinct. So the system starts here and it goes to this steady state. So only the species two survives. But if you have a slow fast system when epsilon is slow, what's happening is may give a completely different impression. Right? So the system first drops down quite fast, then slowly evolves here, right? And that can be regarded as a long transient. It can, it can last for a very long time. Again, there is a scaling for the scaling in this case is one, one inverse epsilon, uh, one over epsilon. So then it fast shoots down to the Isaac line, and then again another stretch of a very slow. Uh, of a very slow change here uh, going to final symptotic state. So um, now that were three basic uh, uh, mechanisms for very simple non-spatial and usually low component two, three, maybe four variable species like that. So now how it can be extended to more realistic or more complicated case of high dimensional systems. So time delay, system with a time delay, of course, immediately becoming, uh, can become infinitely dimensional, if, in fact, even for a single species uh, model, right? It's, I have shown, that's what I showed at the beginning, it's known to generate long transients, but the scaling law is unknown. So what I want to, what, I, what I'm going to say here is that um, uh, for high dimensional systems, that's what, I mean, that's why we enter sort of uncharted waters. There's we know that there are we know that there are long transients, but lots of open questions, not even about the scaling, what 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 kind of dependence, the duration of that long transient may show with time. Something is known, but uh, uh, certainly not enough. Lots of open questions. So noise, noise, intuitive people often say, oh, okay, what you showed is okay, but if you add noise, all your transients will disappear. No, they will not. And in fact, just recently we published a paper here. Uh, I will give you a reference in the last slide that shows that the effect of noise is is quite variable. In some cases, yes, they can make the transients shorter, usually not eliminating them, but making shorter. But in other cases, they can make them longer. And in some other cases, they can actually create transients, create transients for a system where there would be no transients with that of noise. So it's it's a quite a variety of situations. So I only have a one or two minutes and uh, I very briefly, in fact, I think I would like to go very briefly through the spatial case, really just to show you a few figures. So how it looks in the spatial case. Uh, so their earliest example known to me is uh, this this sort of model, right? Time discrete, but uh, non-local in space with the, that would be the uh, normal distribution, right? So non-local in space, uh, integral, 
uh, difference model. And in this case, we have if you if you uh, what is shown here is the average, right, or total. Doesn't really matter. So then you see you have a succession of transient. You have something that looks like a two 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 point periodical cycle, and then suddenly outbreak of chaos, also for a long time, and then suddenly finally real uh, multi uh, a multi point cycle that happens after after a very long time. So that's uh, one kind of spatial system for a diffusion reaction systems. So a, a spatial explicit extension of prey predator system would be a diffusion reaction system. So we can have a completely different type of dynamics. Now it's a sp spatial snapshot, right? So and then you can have a coexistence of two types of dynamics. So we can, we used to call it a wave of chaos, right? So this is spatial temporal chaos with all its attributes, so its sensitivity to the initial condition, and that's a regular dynamics. And this interface or boundary separating two types of dynamics it slowly moves away. So eventually chaos always wins, right? But uh, the time that it takes is extremely long, and actually it's case like that. So L is the length of the system, C is the speed of the uh, all this movement of the boundaries. So um, there can be even more interesting dynamics. In fact, we, you can have unstable plateau, one-dimensional case or two-dimensional case, again, in the diffusion reaction predator system. This is plateau that actually spreads into the, this is the traveling front, right? It spreads into the blue, like shown here. But what is interesting here, this is unstable plateau. It's formed, it's spatially uniform, but formed at the values of unstable equilibrium. So it's clearly another sort of transient, although it, of course, uh, it really needs uh, more discussion. So I have to just keep this. So uh, what is important is long transient exists, and there is some sort of theory for that. It is the beginning of the theory, but many questions remains. Now, very briefly, the contribution of my colleagues. Well, so there was a working group which started in 2017, and for two years we were meeting in person. There were several meetings, but after that, for the next couple of years, we meet in over Zoom, right? But the work is going on. And these are some references. So this is more or less like synthesis because um, there is much more, more specific work focusing on specific system, but this is more generalization of that, right? And uh, thanks for listening. Yes, thank you very much, Sergey, for this very interesting presentation. Indeed, we observe as a strange and behavior in many different systems and sometimes it's difficult to understand the origin uh, of this behavior uh, to to your list of uh, possible mechanisms uh, i would add for example also the influence of boundary conditions sometimes it's also can uh, inf somehow introduce and influence the strange and behavior but i have since we have limited time to discuss i have a short question for example, one of the examples you showed when we have this sometimes complex oscillations and suddenly they change to some different behavior. Mm -hmm. So a very intriguing question when we, are, we are, when we observe these oscillations, how we can, would it be possible to predict somehow this change in behavior? Because of course there are also many applications in everyday life like for example economical crisis or something different what do you think about that um one thing i can say that this is actually the uh, nobel prize question right so if i know <laughs> how to answer this question i would immediately apply for the nobel prize so it's uh, it's, it's extremely so let's let's <laughs> apply to the, to the to the nobel prize committee <laughs> well it's 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 a very i mean I, I know about this question. That question has been asked many times by different people. This is a crucial question, of course. Yeah. If you think about the natural system and predictions and like that, that's a crucial question. But um, unfortunately, almost nothing is known so far about this. It's, uh, some, some approaches exist, actually, but they usually require unrealistic amount of data. Unrealistic amount of data and unrealistic precision, so which is simply Maybe interesting for theory, but not for applications, but largely open. Thank you for this beginning of answer. <laughs> Thank you for this beginning of beginning of answer. We have uh, Alberto, please. We have short time, so we have a time for one short question. Alberto, you can switch on your microphone.
I cannot hear anything. <clears throat> Uh, yes, you can ask. Oh, yes, because I was not authorized ah, well. to switch on my microphone. I congratulate no, I didn't. Sergei for this excellent talk. And I oh, have yeah, a comment. Good to see you. Uh, this talk shows very clearly as phenomena very similar to phase transitions happens in non-special systems. Because there is a long a debate in statistical physics where many um, eminent uh, physicists say phase transitions can happen only in uh, special, uh, specially extended systems, whereas this talk shows that a lot of phenomena like slowing down, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, happens really in uh, in uh, non-special systems. And on the, on on another hand. Uh, uh, mathematical biology can provide, as far as special systems uh, are concerned, simple, uh, simple nonlinear model that have space transition. This was my short comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alberto, for this uh, interesting comment. Unfortunately, we have to stop our discussion. Sergey, thank you again for this uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, we will move to our second speaker. I would like to recall that we changed the program, so the first two speakers are exchanged. So our second speaker is Arnaud de Croix. Arnaud, you can share your screen, please. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. I don't know if you can see something. Your screen, but not slides. And, and ah, yes, now, now we have. Yes, now we, we see the slides. It's OK. Perfect. And it's moved, right? So it's a pleasure for me to introduce Arnaud de Croix. Uh, could you please return to the first slide? Yes. Uh, with the title of the presentation, Threshold Effects for One Dimensional by Stable Equation with Diffusion. Arnaud, please, you can start your presentation. Okay. Thank you very much, Vitaly, for the introduction. So it's a pleasure for me to participate to this workshop. So thank you very much uh, for all the organizers for uh, inviting me. And uh, so uh, today I will uh, speak about uh, this uh, recent work on the threshold effect for bistable equation with diffusion. So it is a joint work with Mathieu Alfaro and uh, Ao Kang. And um, okay, so uh, so this is the, the outline of the talk. So maybe just uh, we can start with the introduction. So the introduction is uh, related to uh, bistable equation. So bistable equation that I will consider in this talk is uh, a simple scalar equation. So you have a density typically, typically of a population and the population is able to diffuse uh, in space, and there is a reaction term which uh, will be assumed to be of bistable type. So bistable type, here I take just uh, a typical example. So bistable type here, I mean that uh, you can think about this uh, cubic-like, uh, this cubic function, so where you have uh, three uh, zeros, u equal zero, u equal one, and u equal theta, so uh, that will be called uh, a threshold parameter. And um, you equip this uh, equation with a step function, so characteristic function of some interval with uh, uh, the height of the step, which is denoted by alpha. And uh, so here it is for the bistable type, uh, bistable type nonlinearity, but I will also consider uh, ignition nonlinearity. So typically, uh, this type of nonlinearity, so the function uh, vanish uh, between uh, zero and theta, and then uh, there is a, um, a positive, uh, I'll take, take some positive value between theta and one and also vanish for u is equal one. 
Okay, so uh, this kind of equation actually, uh, as you, it will be uh, more detailed in, in, the, in the following, so it uh, uh, may admit a threshold effect. So this means that if you take an initial data uh, where the, uh, the length of, of the stamp is sufficiently small, then the solution gas can go to extinction and when the length is uh, uh, sufficiently large and under some condition for the function f, then the solution uh, can propagate, meaning that it can go to one as time goes to infinity. So the question is uh, how to understand this kind of uh, threshold effect. Uh, okay, so here, um, this is the main assumption I will use in this, uh, in this talk. So you have use. So it is either of bistable uh, type or of ignition uh, type. So meaning that f of u is positive uh, on theta and, and 1. It is either strictly negative on 0 theta, either it is equal to 0 uh, for u smaller than theta. So uh, if you consider such uh, a nonlinear function, then uh, the problem, the reaction diffusion uh, problem, admit a traveling wave solution. So this means that it is a special, special solution of the form uh, u of x minus ct. u is the profile of the wave, it is decreasing and connects 0 and 1. And uh, c is the wave speed, and uh, the sign of the wave speed is actually uh, given by the sign of uh, this integral of the nonlinearity. So, in particular, if uh, the integral is negative, the, the speed is negative. If the integral is equal to zero, the speed, oh, sorry, the speed is equal to zero. And if the integral is positive, then the speed is positive. All right. So, now, if you look at uh, the behavior of the solution of the Cauchy problem, so if the integral is negative, uh, you take any initial data and then the solution will go to extinction. If uh, you take uh, the integral is uh, strictly positive, then large initial data will lead the propagation of the solution. But if you take a small initial data, then you will go to extinction. So in the sense that, uh, so if you take a small initial data, uh, alpha, uh, the, the height of the step is uh, smaller than theta, then whatever the length of the step, the solution will go to extinction. If you take uh, uh, the height of the step, which is theta and one, then in that case, you can find a threshold value, so if the length of the step is sufficiently small, uh, the solution goes to zero, and if the length is uh, sufficiently large, then the solution goes to one. So this is, you have two threshold lengths, one that uh, yields to extinction, and the, the other one that yields to propagation. And uh, actually, there's two value uh, coincide uh, for a large number of um, nonlinearity. So this is a notion of a sharp threshold. Uh, so the, the length for propagation and extinction coincides uh, when f is of bistable type and also for the ignition case. And there is a small restriction you need. Uh, you need the function f to be increasing in the right neighborhood of theta. Uh, okay, and uh, so this can be found, uh, this kind of result can be uh, found in the, the paper of Du and Matano, uh, Muratov, uh, and so on. And uh, you also have some results on the sharp threshold for the multidimensional setting as well. All right, so now the question uh, we would like to discuss today is you take an initial data which is a step function and the height of the step function is 
it, it is above uh, the threshold theta. So theta plus epsilon, which is the eighth of the of the step function. And uh, so you have the threshold that uh, depend on the parameter epsilon. And the question is, can we get any quantitative uh, estimate of this threshold, especially uh, when theta is very small? Indeed, in, oh, sorry. If you look at the case where epsilon is equal zero or very small, actually the, the threshold uh, will go to infinity and uh, we, we would like to understand what the size of this length when epsilon is very small. All right. So uh, this is the results uh, we have uh, obtained recently. So you assume that you are in the bistable or ignition case. You assume, if you are in the bistable case, you assume that the, the, the integral is positive. So meaning that the wave of the, the, the wave speed of the traveling wave is positive. Uh, we need uh, some assumption, a kind of what I call a convexity type assumption, meaning that the function f is larger than uh, a straight line uh, when u is uh, smaller than the threshold theta, but slightly uh, larger. The parameter delta here has to be uh, strictly larger than theta. So this means that the function f is above uh, the slope at theta uh, for uh, u uh, smaller than theta and also slightly larger than theta. Okay, so in that case, actually, uh, we have a nice estimate for the for the threshold. Uh, so the threshold leading to extinction and propagation uh, are actually very similar. Uh, they are of order uh, one over log epsilon. So here we do not assume that both are equal. Uh, okay, so uh, we get that the order is one over log epsilon. So in the sense that if you look at the lim half of the quotient, it is a strictly positive. And if you look at the limit sup of the, uh, of the quotient here, it is also uh, uh, a finite number. All right, so we have a rather sharp estimates of the uh, of the threshold as uh, epsilon goes to zero. All right, so uh, the idea is uh, more or less to construct a sub and super solution to control uh, to control the, the the solution. So for the sub solution, of course, we use the convexity uh, assumption. So we construct, we look at the solution with the, the, the linear, uh, the linear nonlinearity. And for the super solution, actually, we compare the function f by uh, uh, um, this uh, type of function. So it is a positive part of the function u minus theta. So it is zero when u is smaller than theta, and then it is a straight line. So when you compare uh, both, you construct sub and super solution using this uh, estimates. Actually, you can get the, the threshold, the estimate for the threshold I mentioned just uh, before. And the key ingredient to, to do that is to look at the heat kernel. So the heat kernel, which is written here. And uh, the threshold actually uh, comes from uh, an estimate of the uh, the tail, the tail of the heat kernel. Oops, sorry. Uh, and you take the integral from t to infinity of the heat kernel, and you look at what's going on when t is very large. And uh, this is related to uh, what we call large de deviation uh, estimates in, in probability. So of course, here we don't need uh, this uh, kind of uh, probability uh, arguments, but in what I will present you uh, just after for non-local diffusion, actually, uh, we can uh, obtain the same kind of results by using 
probability argument of uh, deviation type, large, large deviation type. All right. Okay, so, uh, so what we uh, would like to understand now is, so you take the same problem, but instead of a local diffusion, you take a non-local diffusion here. So non-local diffusion by a probability kernel, let's say, oh, sorry, a probability kernel uh, J, probability function J, and uh, again, uh, you assume that the initial data is a step function with uh, the height, which is uh, slightly larger than the threshold, and the length of the step, which is capital L. And here again, you assume that the non-linearity non is either bistable or ignition. Okay, so um, in that case, uh, the question we would like to, to discuss is, uh, it's exactly the same actually, can we find a threshold for the, the, param for the length of the, um, of the step function And uh, how does it depend on the on the kernel, uh, especially when epsilon is very small? So as we will see in the in the following, uh, the results we obtain uh, st strongly depend on the on the tail of the kernel, and actually they strongly depend on this kind of estimates of this kind of quantities. So you take the kernel J, you take the convolution I time and you look at uh, the mass of this uh, function when x is larger than capital L. And uh, in, the, in the computation, we need to understand this kind of quantity when both i and L are very large. Okay, so maybe we can, uh, we can uh, go to the... Uh, Okay, let me first recall some uh, uh, some um, properties of the uh, non-local diffusion uh, operator. So this is this uh, equation. So you have non-local diffusion uh, without uh, non-linearity. So uh, if you look at this uh, problem, actually you can compute the solution and um, the the uh, fundamental solution of this, uh, of this problem is given by that. So you have uh, exponential minus t, uh, the Dirac mass of zero, plus a smooth function, and the smooth function is actually given by the, uh, this um, exponential-like uh, function. So the sum starts for i is equal to one, And here it involves the uh, convolution uh, i time of the kernel j. And from this formula, actually, you can see that the solution of this problem cannot be uh, smoother than the initial data because of this term. Yeah. All right, and you also have another uh, formulation by using the Fourier transform. You can compute the Fourier transform of the fundamental uh, solution, and it is given by uh, this expression, where uh, j hat is the Fourier transform of the, of, the, of the kernel. And actually, this formulation is also very interesting if you want to uh, estimate the tail of the, of the kernel, of the iterated, uh, iterated uh, kernel, uh, especially uh, using the behavior of the Fourier transform when xi is close to zero, but the estimates are interesting only when the, um, the kernel j has, a seg uh, has an infinite uh, second moment. So this means that when the uh, kernel J uh, does not decay to zero very fast. All right. So uh, now the, the, uh, let's go to the extinction results. So the results we have uh, 
uh, obtain first is a, a condition to, to have extinction. So uh, if you have some uh, relation uh, larger than uh, epsilon, then the, uh, the function starting, the step function starting, uh, the solution starting from this step function is going to extinction for the uh, when time goes to infinity. So this is the first results we have obtained. So with a nice uh, formula involving uh, the tail of the uh, iterated uh, kernel. All right, so maybe I, I don't have time uh, to go to the proof. So uh, maybe uh, just give you uh, the results we have obtained for the propagation. Uh, all right. So for the propagation, actually, um, we need to uh, to know if, a, if you take a step function, do you have propagation or not? And uh, this question for the non-local diffusion actually is not easy, and it is related to the existence of a smooth traveling wave. So smooth traveling wave actually uh, has been studied, and uh, uh, this is some results related to this, uh, the existence of su such a solution. So if you assume that the kernel is uh, rather smooth, uh, in that case, uh, and you have a first moment, you have uh, a traveling wave uh, for, this, uh, for this problem. So with a speed uh, C connecting 0 and 1. And uh, if the speed is non-zero, then the sign of the speed is given by the, the sign of the integral. But in general, uh, it's difficult to, 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 to know that the speed is non-zero. And you may have some situation where this integral is non-zero, but the speed is equal to zero. So uh, to do that, you need to assume a further property for the function f. In particular, if f of u minus u is monotone, then in that case, uh, the sign of the wave speed is given by the sign of the integral. So it is uh, much more complicated than for local diffusion. But anyway, if you have a traveling wave actually connecting 0 and 1, uh, the solution starting from a step function propagate in if the length is sufficiently large as soon as the speed is positive, the speed of the, the, the wave speed is positive. Okay, and in that case, you can uh, also obtain a nice, a nice criterion uh, for the uh, propagation of the solution, a quantitative estimates for the uh, propagation of the solution, which is given like that. And since uh, I don't have a lot of time, I will not go to the detail, but just give you uh, how to uh, use the two estimates for propagation and extinction to obtain uh, estimate with uh, some uh, particular kernel. So maybe I uh, can shift, shift this. Okay, so here I, I just consider uh, two types of kernel. A kernel J with an exponential decay and another type of kernel with an algebraic decay. So, okay, so if you consider a kernel J which has an exponential decay, so meaning that you have this uh, kind of integrability property, in that case, uh, the threshold is actually of the same order as the one for the local diffusion. The threshold is of order log 1 over epsilon. So the kernel with exponential decay share uh, the, uh, same pro uh, the same length uh, that you can get with the local diffusion problem. And if you look at a kernel uh, J with a, has an algebraic decay like that, in that case, the length, the critical length for propagation and extinction is actually of order one over epsilon to the beta. So beta is the decay rate of the kernel J. So here, our uh, estimate is not really sharp, but uh, mostly, so there is a, a 
an additional log term for the upper estimates, but rather sharp. And uh, this shows that the, the, the critical length actually strongly depends on the decay rate of the, of the kernel uh, J. And uh, okay, so the proof are actually uh, very similar to, uh, to the one I discussed for the local diffusion, and it is based on large deviation estimates. So of course, uh, so what I, I have discussed for the example, uh, we can do the same for other type of kernel. So here it is a list of kernel we can also consider and we can get rather sharp estimates for that. And uh, okay. Uh, okay, so maybe I, I will stop here. So I thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Arnold, for this very interesting presentation. So we have uh, several minutes for questions. Please, I recall that uh, our listeners can ask questions by either by raising hand or in the chat and uh, waiting for this possible questions. I will have to make uh, uh, Of course, I have this problem and uh, all of a sudden, this wave propagations and dynamics, we have this question about the initial conditions for which initial conditions mm -hmm. the solution will decay or grow and approach the wave. So uh, last several years, we tried to develop a little bit different approach compared with what we presented is related to pulses. Uh, so in fact, uh, if you consider just uh, it's the result is quite uh, clear for one equation. It becomes a little bit more complex for systems of equations. But if you consider the uh, for for simplicity, uh, one reaction diffusion equation in the bistable case, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, and then simple this bistable nonlinearity. So you can have, as you explained, as we know, uh, this reaction diffusion wave and its speeds is positive if the integral is positive, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. At the same time, we can study the existence of stationary pulses. I mean, a stationary solution, positive stationary solution with zero limits. And then such solution exists also if and only if the integral of the nonlinearity is positive. Mm -hmm. Right? So we are the condition so the wave is positive the wave speed is positive if and only if uh, the pulse exists we can formulate it in this way or mm -hmm. otherwise around pulse exists if and only if the wave speed is positive mm -hmm. this formulation does not include the integral of the solution All right. it's a direct relation uh, between pulse existence and wave speed okay so if we now take systems of equations, in fact, monotone systems of equations, mm -hmm. we don't have relation between the speed and the integral. And we don't have relation between pulse existence. We do have speed. So it's a uh, necessary and sufficient condition. Pulse exists if and only if the wave speed is positive. And well, the mathematical proof is quite complex. It's uh, all this story which you know only Risha, the method, a priori estimates, all the things. So the initial, if we now consider unstationary problem, then the initial condition, if you want to approach the wave, there, there are two conditions. First, the wave speed should be positive. Mm -hmm. And second, since the wave speed is positive, we know that the pulse exists. So the second condition is that the initial condition should be larger than the pulse. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. You see? So, mm -hmm. okay, of course, of course, well, it's, it's not a complete answer. If the initial condition is larger than the pulse, then it will converge. If it is smaller than the pulse, it will decay to zero. So, of course, we can ask the question if it is somewhere larger, somewhere smaller. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Then, then we, of course, we don't have uh, this uh, complete analytic answer, of course. But what I wanted just to say uh, uh, that with this different approach, at least for monotone reaction difference system, we have this direct relation between positiveness of the wave speed, pulse existence, and the initial conditions which provide convergence mm. to the wave or the absence of convergence. Okay, so I stop on that. So, uh, do we have uh, other questions? Not yet. Okay, so, well, in fact, uh, the next talk, it's, it will uh, the next talk, it will be Leon Crooks. We have uh, still several, several minutes. So, uh, then uh, we can continue. What you explained, as far as I understand, it basically concerns one equation, right? Uh, local or non-local. Can you comment about maybe uh, possible generalizations of these results? For example, for systems of equations. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, to to get the the, the the estimate for the for the threshold of course we use uh, the fact that the, the solution is propagating and uh, um, to do that there is two two main ingredients uh, you need to to know that the solution propagates so as you say uh, maybe we can do that by uh, using pulse like solution but uh, so here we use some uh, the idea of Fife and MacLeod to uh, to obtain the propagation, and um, uh, actually here it is slightly different because we we want to show that the solution propagate as soon as uh, the the height of the step is uh, slightly above the threshold, not very larger than the threshold, but slightly above any. For any value larger than the threshold, you can find the length which is sufficiently large. So here, um, so we use the, the the wave to construct a sub solution by using the Fife and MacLeod arguments. Yeah, right. and uh, and we we can do that uh, without any knowledge on the behavior of the wave at infinity. Uh, we don't know. We just assume that the first moment. Uh, of the kernel is uh, is uh, exists and uh, uh, this means that the wave actually uh, converge to the equilibria uh, and it is uh, L1 function both sides and this is the only uh, the only property we use to to obtain this kind of propagation so uh, for generalization. Um, Maybe uh, for monotone systems, you can apply this uh, com comparison theorems and construct upper and low, uh, lower functions. Right. Probably, probably we can do that. Yeah. Uh, provided that there exists a wave solution. Right. But we know that. Well. Okay. Okay. We have, in fact, uh, one more question from Benjamin. Uh, yeah. Uh, Benjamin, go ahead. Hi, Arno. Yeah. Uh, no, just a, a, a remark that ca came to me. Uh -huh. uh, so basically, you you distinguish your uh, propagation or not with uh, respect to, with your initial condition. Right. And what came to me is that uh, usually uh, you can also see it's the same phenomenon, and it's it may happen in some more complicated context, but the phenomenon is the same. You can act on the size of, for example, a non on uh, in homogeneity with uh, some parameter which depends on x and then you will have the same phenomena either from a different kind of mechanisms as you be stability or other and then the waves propagated or not and yeah the question do you think you can apply the same techniques or kind of if you, you don't work with initial condition but with the size of uh, of the yeah, yeah. inhomogeneity yeah, uh, yeah I, I don't know exactly the, the problem you have in mind, but usually if the medium is not homogeneous, it's quite complicated to deal with, uh, it can be complicated to deal with a traveling wave solution. So uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if we can, uh, if you can do something, if you have uh, 
uh, spatial heterogeneity for the in, in the model. Maybe if it is localized, why not? If it is periodic, probably you can do something. But if it is uh, rather general, maybe it uh, it can be complicated. So it really depends on the problem you have in mind. Actually. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, indeed, it's a very interesting question, and we also started sometimes these uh, problems. Uh, uh, non autonomous with this heterogeneous space dependence. There are many open questions indeed. So, thank you again, Ar Arno, for this very interesting yeah. presentation. And I suggest to uh, to move to, to our next uh, presentation, Elian Crooks. Elian, could you please share your screen? Yes, we see your screen and, uh, and uh, also probably full screen, right? Yes, and also full screen. Uh, thank you. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, Ilian Crooks, uh, from the University of Swansea. And Sorry, I, yeah. The star liquid, crystal, liquid crystals. Uh, please, Ilian, you can begin your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank the organizer very much for the invitation to speak at this very interesting and nice workshop. Um, I also would like to apologize that my 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 talk is not directly related to to biomedicine or 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 even to or even to biology. Uh, but in fact, so it's, it's it's a talk about liquid crystals and it's joint work with Michael Grinfeld and Jeff Mackay from Strathclyde. Um, and so there, there is quite a strong group on on applied problems in liquid crystals at Strathclyde, and and this came out of that. Um, but I did look a little bit um, be, before giving this talk about whether there were some connections I had not known about, and I discovered that some viruses do actually act as liquid crystals, for example, the tobacco mosaic virus. Um, but I'm not claiming a direct connection there. I, I just wanted to point out that there, there is perhaps more of a connection than I had at first thought. And so um, let me let me try and move to the next slide. I'm having some. OK, here we go. OK, so here is the equation that I'm going to talk about. So let me start with the equation and I'll say a little bit briefly about the motivation afterwards. And so I'm going to talk about this this quasi linear um, green PDE. And so it's quasi linear here. So we have two constants in the problem. So one of them is psi, which you can see on the slide. And this is a certain measure of anisotropy. And there's another parameter beta, which is sitting inside the, the reaction term. So inside the F term. And so these are both constants. And so beta, in a sense, it controls the shape of the nonlinearity and psi is a certain measure of anisotropy. And just to cut to the chase, um, the question that we wanted to answer was to do with the effect of psi on the, the spreading speed or the minimal traveling wave speed uh, for this problem. So what is the, the effect of the parameter psi on the speed of spread of a certain class of solutions um, and, and related to switching properties of liquid crystals? And so this is the this is the equation. This is the basic framework. And so before I say a little bit about where it came from, uh, let me just say um, a little sort of few things about the ingredients so that so that you so that you somehow get the picture. And so the first thing is about this nonlinearity f, right? So it's made up of these trick functions, and they come from the model. Um, but but what do we have? So um, clearly, because of the presence of the sign term, we have equilibria at all uh, integers. But in particular, we have equilibria when v is zero and when v is one. And so if we and if we take a beta to be between zero and strictly less than one, then we're essentially in what's called a monostable problem where f prime of zero is positive and f prime of one is negative. And so what you can see here on the slide are just some uh, quick sketches of the form of the nonlinearity for a number of different values of beta, starting when beta is zero, when you get this uh, symmetric uh, nonlinearity, and then beta is increasing, and then in the fifth one, beta is 0 0.99, so it's very close to one, but not actually equal to one, and then you can see that it's very flat at the origin. And so this is essentially the effect of beta, that it makes it flatter and flatter and flatter at the origin, and we'll see that this plays a role a little bit later on. And so what we're going to be interested in are uh, traveling wave solutions. 
And so in particular, uh, decreasing traveling wave solutions, sorry about that, um, where we have a little v of xt is capital V of x minus ct, as I'm sure everybody here knows. And then it's going to connect uh, the profile, capital V connects one at one end and zero at the other end. And so here is the, the somehow the motivation for the model. So just to show you a little bit where things come from. Uh, so this is the liquid crystal model. And in liquid crystals, the molecules, they have a sort of director, uh, which here we'll call N, which gives you a unit vector, giving you the molecular alignment. And the molecules are supposed to be in well-defined layers, so the so-called smectic layers here. Um, a here is a constant vector, so normal to the smectic layers, and N is the, N is the, the direction of the molecules. And in this particular uh, model, um, the, the direction of the molecule, it will process around a cone, and the cone has a constant tilt angle to the, to the vertical, and the, the angle phi tells you where you are around about this cone, and phi is our dependent variable, essentially. Um, so it will depend on x and t. So here I'm going to suppose things are constant in the y direction for simplicity. So things are essentially propagating to the right in the x direction. They depend upon t. And the thing that is changing in x and t is this variable phi, which is essentially this azimuthal angle. OK, and then in the in the following, we need some extra vectors. So we have C, which is the projection of N into the smectic layer and B, which is a vector which is perpendicular to that. And we also have a constant field, a, a constant electric field in the in the problem, which is the which is which is denoted by E. OK, but the key thing is simply that phi is the dependent variable. It depends on X and T and it's the thing that's going to change in space and time. And the model is the following. Uh, so it comes from a continuum theory of Leslie Stewart and Nak Nakagawa uh, from the early 90s. And so it's based so there's a free energy density, which has an elastic part, a polarization part, and a dielectric part. And the anisotropy comes from the elastic energy density. And it comes from the fact that there is empirical, so experimental evidence, that there um, is a difference in the electric, sorry, in the elastic constant between uh, the direction, which is the, the B direction and the C direction, essentially. So the B direction is the propagation of the director into the plane, and the, sorry, C is the direction into the plane, and B is the one perpendicular to that. And if you model that, if you write one of the constants as a constant times one minus xi, and the other one is the same constant as one plus xi, then you get the term that you can see here on the screen, uh, where you have a, a, a xi uh, term, and if xi is equal to zero, then the constants are the same, and it can be anything between minus, strictly between minus one and plus one, and it gives you a measure of the anisotropy. And it could be either positive or negative, depending on the scenarios. And then there's some other stuff that I won't go into in detail. There's some energy density from spontaneous polarization, some dielectric energy density, and when you put it all together, you get this W of phi that's sitting at the bottom of the slide, um, where you have this sort of quasi-linear kind of term with phi x squared that's got the psi in it that's coming from these two um, different el elastic constants, and then you have the other pit where you have beta, and beta is our parameter um, which is built up of, of a number of other constants that come into the problem. For example, theta here is the is the tilt angle of the cone. And so this is our free energy density. And then if you do a model using an L2 gradient flow and you make a change of variables, um, so you let V be a half minus um, phi divided by pi, then you get the green equation from our first slide. Uh, so that's a kind of whistle stop tour of the of the origins of the model. But this is where we get our quasi linear term with our quasi linear PDE from. And then the idea is that traveling wave solutions connecting uh, two constant states of the liquid crystal. So here they're going to be one and zero. Um, they model switching between those constant states and therefore have potential applications to fast electro optical switches. And one is interested in the speed at which the switching takes place. And in particular, therefore, one is interested in the in the speed of the traveling waves. And OK, so this is the setup. And so before I say exactly what we're going to do, let me just tell you a few things which will be pretty familiar, um, but just to ju just to give some sort of background context. And so here we're looking at traveling fronts. 
And so, so what equations do they satisfy? So if you look in this context, then the, the profile V will satisfy the, the second order ODE at the top of the slide. If you look in the phase plane, this is heteroclinic connections between one zero and zero zero. And then as is very well known, if you have a second order equation of this type and you're interested in monotone solutions, you can make a change of variables that turns it from a second order equation into a first order equation. And here, because of the quasi-linear terms, uh, the change of variables we make, so we have capital F of V is this term involving minus the square root of one plus psi cos of two pi V multiplied by dV by dz. And if you substitute it in, you get the first order equation that's sitting at the bottom of this side. Um, let me also say, which I forgot to say earlier, but let me say it now, um, that when you have this term, the square root of one plus psi cos of two pi V, so V is varying between zero and one. And that means that that cos term is, sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative, right? So it's not obvious what kind of effect that term is going to have. And, and we see this a bit in the analysis later. Okay, so this is just the traveling fronts and they satisfy the ODE that you have at the bottom of the slide. And then in the case when Xi is zero, this is a very well studied problem. And indeed, it's known that there exists a monotone decreasing front connecting one to zero for all speeds greater than or equal to some critical value. This is essentially the prototype is the KPP equation. It's well known for monostable equations. And in fact, via a suitable change of variables, one can essentially immediately get corresponding results in the quasi-linear case. And then not only do we have existence for all C greater than or equal to some critical value, but we also have that this critical value is bounded below by a value that comes from the linear problem. And here that's just the square root of twice one plus psi one minus beta. And that's just because if you take a lower speed than zero zero is a stable spiral in the phase plane. And so you can't have a monotone solution connecting to zero for such a speed. OK, so there are two things, um, existence for C bigger than or equal to some critical value, and that, that critical value is bounded below by something from the linear problem. And in general, this um, this minimal value of the, 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 the existence, the, sorry, this minimal value of the traveling wave speed, it might be strictly greater than the, the linear value, or it might be equal. And in the greater case, it's often called a pushed front or nonlinear selection, something of that type. Um, and if it's equal, it's a pulled front because essentially the behavior is being pulled by what's happening at infinity. And this is sometimes called linear selection or linear determinacy. And I'm showing on the slide a very famous example from an old paper of Harlan Rosser that shows that both things can happen. And so this is just the equation ut is uxx plus u1 minus u1 plus au. Here is a positive constant and it just inserts an extra equilibrium at minus one over a. So as you can see in the little cartoon and as a changes, essentially we're still interested in solutions which lie between zero and one. But as a changes, it changes the, the form of f, particularly in a neighborhood of the origin. And it can be shown in this case that the linear value is in fact always equal to two for any A, um, but the minimal wave speed um, is two when A is between zero and two, and then it's something else which is bigger than two when A is bigger than two. So it's A plus two divided by the square root of two times A. Um, and what that says is that the problem is linearly determinate. Um, so you have the equality case if and only if A lies between zero and two. Right, so sometimes it's linearly determinate and sometimes it's not linearly determinate. Okay, and there's a well known sufficient condition, uh, which is in the same paper, which says that if you have that f of u lies under the tangent uh, at the origin, then you must have equality. And this condition is not necessary, so you can actually see that from the previous example. So the condition only holds when a is between zero and one, whereas we still have linear determinacy up to a equal to two. And at this point, it's good to revisit those little pictures we had of the functions f, uh, which depend on beta, because you can see here that um, the, the graph will lie underneath the tangent at the origin. Well, it's certainly true when beta is equal to zero. And in fact, it continues to be true up to beta is equal to a quarter. And then it becomes not true. 
OK, and so in fact, um, if you have that F is concave, then you will have equality in the case where you have the isotropic problem when psi is equal to zero, just from this classical result. And so our aim was to essentially to investigate the role of psi in the in the in the in the in the, in the speeds, in particular the traveling wave speeds. And so we wanted to know in particular when we had linear determinacy and when we did not have linear determinacy. And this is because we wanted, first of all, we wanted to know the value of the minimal speed. And especially in so the case when psi is zero is well studied. And in that case, we have that this minimal speed is, is also the spreading speed of solutions of the initial value problem of the of the PDE with compactly supported initial conditions. And so in that case, the minimal wave speed is likely to characterize what you actually see in practice. And moreover, the stability of fronts in terms of the initial value problem is different depending on whether or not you have linear determinacy or not. Right, so whether or not a front has the minimal speed and whether or not the minimal wave speed is linearly determinate. And for that, I mean, you know, for what initial conditions, in what sense do you have that the solution of the initial value problem will converge to what to the front as t tends to infinity. And what I forgot to say when I was saying about the value of the minimal speed is that, you know, if you do have linear determinacy, often it's it's easier to calculate, to actually calculate a value of the wave speed from the linear problem, which is which is often what you would actually like to know in terms of applying this to applications. So this is essentially the question that we have. And we wanted to investigate the role of the parameter psi. Sorry, I'm just quickly looking at the time. Um, and so let me first of all tell you some things about the isotropic case. So the isotropic case, so this is when we, we actually have a, a semi-linear equation, psi is zero. And in this case, um, the linear speed is actually just the square root of two times one minus beta. And in this case, there happens to be a family of explicit solutions. So these were discussed um, in, a, in a liquid crystal paper of Stuart and Mamomiat, but actually we also earlier in by Clarkson and Mansfield. And so there are basically just there a family of explicit profiles. There are uh, multiples of the sine function when you look in the in the F variable with speed one over the square root of two times beta. And as must be the case, we have that this uh, speed of the explicit solution is always greater than or equal to the speed, uh, the linear speed, as it must be, uh, because we have the linear speed as a lower bound, and the two curves touch when beta is equal to a half, right? So the blue curve is the curve of the speeds from the linear problem, and these explicit, this family of explicit solutions um, is, the, is, the is the red curve and it lies above and touches when beta is equal to a half. And what you can show, um, exploiting the fact that you have this family of explicit solutions, is that you actually have a switching whereby um, you have linear determinacy when beta is between zero and a half. So that means the minimal speed is given by the linear problem when beta is between zero and a half. Whereas if beta is between a half and one, then the minimal speed uh, is not given by the linear problem, but it's given by this explicit traveling wave solution. And so you have this switching from the, let me go back to the curve, you, get, you have this switching from the uh, blue curve onto the red curve when beta is equal to a half. And so the proof, um, the proofs are, are not very difficult. So um, to get the, the linear determinacy, you essentially exploit the fact that the minimal wave speed can be characterized using a minimax formula, so an infsup formula, which you can see here. And um, this gives you a ready source of upper bounds, right? You just plug in a suitable F and it gives you an upper bound. And if you do it carefully and you make a good choice, then it gives you enough information to show that C star is actually equal to the linear value. And in this case, uh, good choice means multiples of sine functions. And so if you plug them in and do some calculations, then it shows you that you have linear determinacy in that case. On the other hand, if beta is between a half and one, then one can exploit the fact that um, if you have a front that you know converges at the faster of the two possible rates, 
So there are two ways of thinking about it, faster of two possible rates, or that the integral that you can see here is finite, which amounts to the same thing, then it must be, um, yes, that, that, that a front has, that, that front has to be the, the minimal, the one of minimal speed. And so if you have an explicit front, you can simply check it. And so that's exactly what you do uh, in this case, you have an explicit wave solution, you check explicitly that it converges at such a rate that the integral that you see at the top of the slide is finite, and that happens precisely when beta is a half, which tells you that that is the minimal, the front of minimal speed in that case. And so this is, I mean, this is a nice example where you have this switching um, depending on the depending on the, the variable beta. And in fact, because it was because of this switching that it's also discussed in, in, the, in the nice traveling wave book of Gilding and Kersner, and also why it was discovered um, earlier by Ben Sarlos also in the liquid crystal problem. And so what we wanted to look at uh, was what is the role of the parameter psi, right? So this was a nice sort of warm up problem. Uh, but what happens when psi is not equal to zero? And so when psi is not equal to zero, so let me sort of just, without going into too many details, um, show you a kind of summary. So in this case, um, we certainly don't know of any explicit traveling wave solutions, um, unlike in the case when psi is zero. Uh, so now we're in the quasi-linear problem uh, where psi is this measure of anisotropy, uh, which comes from the possible difference in the two elastic constants in the different directions. And we also expect there to be a symmetry between psi is negative and psi is positive. And so this is a summary of the results that one can show. So this is parameter space. So in the horizontal direction, we have the variable psi, so this measure of anisotropy. And then in the vertical direction, we have beta. So this is the parameter that controls what have the, the shape of the nonlinearity f. And the blue region is where we have linear selection, and the red region is where we have nonlinear selection. And the isotropic case corresponds to psi equal to zero, so that corresponds to the vertical line going straight up the middle of the diagram. And you can see the, the switch at beta equal to half that we've just shown um, or claimed. Um, and so you have the, the linear selection up to beta to half, and then you have a switching into the red nonlinear selection when beta is between zero and one. And what one can show is that you actually have linear selection in the blue region and nonlinear selection in the red region. And in addition, there is an increasing function beta of psi, which passes through the point zero a half. So it passes through the point in the middle of the diagram, which separates the regions of linear selection and nonlinear selection. And one thing that is interesting about this, that I found interesting about this, is that the region of nonlinear selection is quite large, right? It's, it's, it's not something that very rarely happens for this example. It's really quite a large region of parameter space in which you have nonlinear selection that's coming from the fact that you have this anisotropy. And so just to give you just a few ideas of, of, of where this comes from, it's not, it's not too difficult to get a handle on that. So here are just a few key tools. So in order to make it easier to write, let me just write h of psi and v as the square root of one plus psi cos of two pi v. And as previously noted, um, this cos of two pi v, it can be either positive or negative, right? So it, yeah, it can, it can be either positive or negative. Um, and so we have that this h, it always lies between the square root of one minus mod psi and the square root of one plus mod psi. And then here are a few key ingredients. So the first one is that, you know, partly using some old ideas of Engler, um, it can be shown that there is a travelling front solution v of the, the quasi-linear problem that we're interested in connecting zero to one, if and only if there exists a traveling wave solution U of a different semi-linear problem where the psi dependence has been moved onto the reaction term. And you know, this is this is interesting and it's it's very useful for some things. I should note though that the change of variables uses the traveling wave profile. So this is useful for the traveling waves. 
Um, but it's a travelling wave thing rather than a change of variables that applies to the whole PDE. So that's one thing. Uh, second thing, using that and the, the sort of infsoup, well-known infsoup formula for semilinear equations, one can derive corresponding infsoup formulae for the quasi-linear problem. And you can see here two different versions of that. So one is when you have this h of xi sitting outside um, sitting outside the, the, the f prime v plus f of v over capital F of v term. Um, but because with these with these families of test functions, you know that a function is in the family precisely when h times the function is in the family, you can have alternative forms, right? You can have alternative forms where here we have an h sitting outside, and these different forms are, are useful for different things. Um, and then let me mention also another different type of variational formula, which is an extension of ideas of Benguri and de Passy, um, which, where you have an integral form. And you can see the H sitting there on the denominator. And using these ingredients, um, one can show uh, quite easily that the, the, the minimal speed for the Xi dependent problem is trapped between um, the minimal speed when xi is zero and some bounds involving xi. And this essentially comes immediately, one can see it from the Ben Guria de Passe type variational formula that using the sort of basic estimates on h xi of v, um, you simply do the estimates and then uh, use the variational formula and you get the, the estimate at the top of the slide. And this estimate that you see at the top of the slide combined with um, ex the explicit formula that, that we have for the minimal speed in the xi equals zero case gives you quite a lot of information. And in summary, it gives you the information that you see on the next slide, um, which is a lot of what we had before, but not quite all of it. Um, so with a few extra tricks that I won't go into in detail, you can add in a couple of other zones, which gives you the red part and the blue part. Um, another sort of interesting thing, um, which is kind of a trick, so let me show it to you, is that we also have this curve which separates the, the red part from the blue part. And this comes from essentially the following kind of argument. So, you know, if you have that the minimal speed is equal to the linear value for certain parameters, then it must they must also be equal when xi is bigger than xi star um, or if beta is less than beta star, right? So this is basically looking along either horizontal lines in parameter space or along vertical lines in parameter space. And this is something which is which essentially looks like a fluke. So let me show it to you. Um, and this is something that it would be un interesting to understand whether it is somehow a mathematical fluke or there's something deeper behind it. And so here is the idea. So if you have, um, so, okay, so let's look at the minimal speed um, with parameters beta star and psi star. Then we know that there is a decreasing front um, for that speed. So that gives us a corresponding profile F hat. So we can write it like that. And then we essentially use that profile as a test function in the minimal speed for different parameter values. OK, so you do that and I've written it here. So you have the infsup, then you have an upper bound from plugging in something explicit. You rearrange things, you identify that some things are actually equal to the speed. And then you get this quantity involving the sup over V between zero and one of H Xi divided by H Xi star. And so this is a ratio of these terms uh, involving the square root of one plus Xi cos of two pi V. And when you look at that, so it's not obvious what that is because of the fact that cos changes sign um, as, as V ranges between zero and one. But when you look at it, it turns out that because of the particular structure you have, it's bounded above by the value when it potentially attains its supremum when V is equal to zero. You just do it by plugging it in and doing the calculation and seeing that that is in fact correct. OK, and that means that for that soup, you can substitute in the value when V is equal to zero. You get some cancellation, which gives you that the linear values are the same. OK, so here we're using something quite special about this particular structure of this H function that comes into the quasi linear term. 
And then just to finish up, uh, because I think I'm almost out of time, um, I just wanted to say, so this is, I mean, we did all of this uh, for this liquid crystal problem and we got this big region where you have nonlinear selection, um, which was something interesting to discover. Um, but then we also realized later that this is actually, there is somehow a general framework that includes both of the, the old Hadler and Roth example and also the liquid crystal example that I mentioned. And so it's given by this family F of, of U beta that you can see on this on this slide. And it looks a little bit special. It's got this H function and these A and Bs that are parameters of beta. Um, but it turns out that both of our previous examples in the isotropic case do fit into this. Um, and so this is how they fit into this. Sorry, I'm going through a bit quickly. Um, but you have this, now I'm replacing my old A by beta just for consistency, but they both fit into this, um, they both fit into this sort of general framework. And one can essentially just use the ideas that we use to prove the the results in the liquid crystal case to, to prove that you also get switching for this general family. And there are other theorems that one can prove where you, you assume different things about the way that these um, A, and B, uh, A and B depend upon beta. Um, but I think I won't go into that now. Um, and I'll leave it there and skip to the last slide where there are a couple of references. And thank you very much for your attention. And uh, in fact, in fact, I'm not familiar with this liquid uh, crystal problem. So I really like to to learn all that from you now. Uh, and I have a couple of questions related to that. In particular, sure. when you explain the model, the derivation of the model, is it really a derivation from the first physical principle? It's not just some heuristic, heuristic phenomenological model, but a, a real physical model for that for liquid crystal. Um, I think it is a real physical model. I mean, I think there are some approximations. Let me just go back to the model. Um, but I think it is a real physical model. And um, sorry, I'm just going back to the model. Um, so, I mean, it's essentially the key part is this free energy density sitting at the top. And, and, and the fact that you have these different ingredients into that. And in particular, that you have this um, and the fact that you have these two different elastic constants. Um, so, I mean, I think there are approximations that, you know, for example, it's not necessarily the case that you that your layers are completely parallel and they're completely flat and this kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. It's really, it's really very interesting. It's just opens for me, for me, of course. This is known uh, for other people, but it opens for me a new field of applications. And I would like to ask a question. Of course, you presented this very interesting and detailed study of wave of wave speed, but what about convergence? Yeah, that's a very good question. So in, in the case where psi uh, is not zero, sorry. Uh, is, it start, is, is it started? No. Is it started already or not yet? No, it, I think it's not studied as far as if I had, if, unless it's somewhere that I haven't found it, I think it's not studied. And in that change of variables that I mentioned related to the old Engler paper, that really is, is a traveling wave change of variables. It uses the profile to change the variables. So you get this correspondence between the traveling waves, but it's not clear. It's, it's not clear that you can immediately get information about the stability for the for the quasi-linear problem from what's known for the for the semi-linear problem. Uh, this is exactly was the second part of my question. But when you make this change of variables, as you explained, you reduce the problem to this nonlinearity k x, right? Yeah. But is it for the whole time-dependent problem or only for the stationary problem? It's only for the traveling wave problem. Uh, Ah, only for the, okay, okay. It uses, it uses the traveling wave profile in the change of variables. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Very interesting. So I look forward to the next uh, presentation about uh, stability and convergence. To, okay. <laughs> to the, by the way, if you want to discuss, I, am, I will be very much interested because like during the last 40 years, I study <laughs> this kind of problems. <laughs> Thank you very much again, and it's time for us to move to our next presentation and the, the last presentation of this.
session. Benjamin, you can show your screen. Yes, we see the screen and maybe you can uh, make full, full screen mode also. Yes, this is perfect. Let me introduce uh, Benjamin Ambrosio from the University of uh, Harvard. And the title of presentation is Complex and Dynamical Systems, a few mathematical perspective with, uh, with applications to neuroscience. Please, Benjamin, you can start your presentation. <laughs> All right, so I, I, I do it again. And then, uh, yeah. All right. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to to share some of my uh, research. So you hear me, right? It's okay. Yes, we hear you. So please, you can okay, continue. Okay, okay. So this is the outline of the talk. So I will start with um, an introduction on uh, complex systems and networks and applications. Then I will move to networks of ODEs uh, in neuroscience context and brain rhythms. Then in the third part, I will talk about synchronization of patterns. And then in the fourth part, uh, we'll get more into more details and bifurcations, pattern formation, and asymptotic behavior in a few reaction diffusion systems. So what about complex systems? So uh, there's a lot of ideas out there and uh, there's not a unified, very precise definition of complex systems, but uh, we can, people agree upon some, some facts, and so I try a definition here. So complex systems are systems composed of many components, so there are more than one component, and they, they, they interact together, and this makes, uh, this, this brings the possibility of a rich behavior and uh, with a huge range of phenomena. So there are some key concepts. So uh, let's let's say let's give some of them. Um, so yeah, so the there there is an uh, a competition, if I if I may say, between the individual intrinsic properties of each individual and the interactions, and this provides the global behavior as a wall. And in this context, uh, there are phenomena, emergent phenomena that comes from the, that. And usually a key uh, thing of the complex system is that you cannot predict uh, this emergent phenomena. Uh, you, you, you cannot think about it before uh, this interaction. And so, just a few striking examples. Uh, so first, you have this uh, the, the flocking stuff. Uh, so when these birds moves together, so this is typically a, a complex system. And so the the basic models can go back to 1987, and you can obtain some quite realistic, uh, interesting behavior with only three rules, uh, and they are here. So short range motion, uh, position of neighbors, all right? so. With uh, three rules, you can obtain this kind of behavior. So this is uh, a lot studied. And uh, uh, I heard recently a, a talk from Pierre de Bon on kind of very, very deep math on that, or quite deep math on that. 
Okay, then another well-known example is the, the synchronization. And since I will talk about that later, I give here uh, a small movie of that. So you have a few metronomes, so each one has its own rhythm. And then the, uh, the guy here put it on this soda cans, and as you can see, they synchronize their oscillations. All right. So, sorry. And so, one of the basic models that consider uh, synchronization of oscillators is the Kuramoto model. And of course, there are more models uh, for that. I have to look here. Okay, some more uh, examples. So one which is important for what I want to talk is the brain. And so the brain, of course, has neurons, a huge amount of neurons and connections. So it's typically uh, complex system. And so for the connectivity, you can either consider the anatomical or functional connectivity uh, at rest or following some uh, stimulus. And so just just some image that, like the so you can consider just the wiring, which is the an anatomical or you can consider uh, uh, or other statistical analysis to, to see which zone of the brain is connected with others or look at uh, in front of one stimuli, one stimulus, what zone is going to light up. And okay, so this gives you the, the properties, meaning the connectivity of the network and you have also the properties of each neuron of each zone of the, the network. Just a few examples, of course, complex systems. It's a huge uh, domain of application. There's a lot of, for example, uh, people from theoretical physics. And so it has, uh, it has exploded this, uh, this topic. And this is one example of the paper in Nature. And uh, it got published because it, it, it showed that uh, there are some, um, some, some problems with security. Uh, we and the, the the network of the the internet was involved in there, and they so uh, Barabasi in his own site uh, tells this story, and it, it's interesting. So how we get published this paper on nature? Sorry about that. And of course, uh, you can also uh, provide models of networks uh, with epidemics and social networks, and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to consider more specifically is that at each node, I consider a dynamical system. It can be an ODE, uh, deterministic or stochastic, a PDE, and then you have some coupling between uh, the nodes of the system. Those, these are uh, the general setting that uh, we, we consider. And so I, I will start by presenting some results from uh, a, a PhD that uh, that ended uh, last year. And so you can go, of course, uh, from very complicated models that try to 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 catch to grab the the a lot of phenomena in in biology. And you start from the right, and the more you want to do math, uh, you have to simplify things. So the idea of the thesis is we've started with a couple of papers on the V1 uh, in the brain, visual cortex V1. And uh, from those papers, we, who 
presented a quite intricate model of uh, V1 and quite realistic. Uh, we tried to do some uh, more theoretical stuff, uh, numerical, and uh, with the hope that we can uh, prove theorems on this direction. And the idea is, is that, so you couple uh, ODEs, but you, you drive it stochastically. And this represents the information that, you, that your brain uh, receives, and we consider here some stochastic input. You can refine that and do more specific uh, signals, which will present things that you, so the, you can say a lot of things of that, but so we consider just that a stochastic drive. And then you have the network connections, and I will call that it's called the recurrent activity. So again, there is a competition here between the stochastic drive, the interesting property of at each node, the dynamical system, the ODE that you consider, and all the network uh, connects. So more precisely, we consider those equations. So the four equations are uh, the Ochkin Huxley, I will come back to that later. And to construct the network, you have, in our case, to add two equations that will, uh, that will, let me show you that, that will act here on these two uh, terms. And so here you have the two things. The, the stochastic drive, which are Poisson inputs uh, with Giracs, so meaning that when you receive a Girac, you have a jump on GE, and uh, each time one of the cells cross a threshold, it, uh, it informs and it gives a signal to all is postsynaptic neurons, and this, uh, this brings up the, the network structure. All right, and so uh, this is the network. So in the, in the work of uh, Mohamed Mama, uh, it was about uh, 500 neurons. Okay, so, so once you have a realization of the, the stochastic process, then it's not hard, uh, the, the, it's, it's, it's easy to prove that on each uh, interval, the, you, you have a Cauchy problem for the OGE, so you have the solution. And so, the, the, so it's indexed by this uh, stochastic process. So you, you, you have this theorem, and this comes basically from the, from the structure of hodgkin Huxley, which has a bounded, uh, a positively invariant uh, set, and uh, the 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 fact that the we know the the stochastic process uh, by the Poisson inputs. Okay, of course, uh, if you want to to consider things more in details, you have to look at. Uh, the dynamics of Hodgkin Huxley, and basically, so actually, you, you can not prove everything on the Hodgkin Huxley, and uh, but you you have uh, you have numerically you have a limit cycle that you can see here, and from values of the parameter i here, uh, you have coexistence of the this limit cycle and the uh, attractive uh, stationary point, but you see that if you move it, the if you move these trajectories a little bit, you will evolve towards the limit cycle. So Hutchinson said it's very interesting. It has a lot of things, and for example, you can see you have this kind of even there's no uh, slow parameter here. You have a slow fast structure. So this has been uh, studied a lot, but uh, everything is not known uh, in this equation. Okay, but now 
uh, once you study the, the details from the Hodgkin Huxley, you want to move to the wall structure of um, of the network. And what we we did here is what we we found a path from stochastic homogeneity, meaning that all the all the neurons uh, seem to 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 spike randomly. So this is what is called a raster plot. And when you increase one of the parameters, you go from the stochastic homogeneity, what, what, where each neuron spikes randomly, towards states where uh, you can see some uh, structure in the in the in the spikes, and at the end you have the wall synchronization. So uh, this. Uh, is studied by the people from neuroscience and is correlated with uh, so realistic is this more this one when you from precise signals you can observe uh, this kind of uh, patterns all right so this is called more background activity and this uh, is uh, it follows some kind of stimulus, all right? And so this is, this is an emergent property, the synchronization. Another one is that you get uh, the correlation between GE and GI, which appears when you increase this parameter. You can observe gamma uh, rhythm in the network and the rhythm of the network can be different from the rhythm of each neuron. So again, there's a competition between mainly the th three things, the interesting property of the nonlinear dynamics that you have on the neuron, then you have the stochastic drive, and then you have the interaction. And how this cooked up uh, together, uh, that's what we try to, to study in there and to reach to this kind of uh, pictures. And in our case, the, the, the neurons were kind of uh, stimulated a lot and the, the structure of the neuron of the, of the network um, put down a little bit the, this, this excitation and to, to make appear all these uh, patterns. All right, uh, I have to check the time. Yeah. Okay, and so one of the, this is the huge thing. So brain rhythms. So people observe uh, a, a lot of uh, rhythms. And so I think there's a lot of, things to do for uh, mathematicians uh, to bring uh, techniques to, to, to study uh, this more. And so when you do these networks, again, you, you see these rhythms. For example, we, we were able to produce these gamma rhythms here. And so, uh, I put that because it, it's it's known in the community, in neuroscience community, that th there is a correlation between GE. So GE, it's the the conductance uh, related to the excited excitation, excitation, and GI is the conductance related to inhibition, inhibition. And you can observe this correlation. That's why I mentioned it in my previous slide. And so I just wanted to mention uh, this work. Um, so uh, done with Lesonium. And uh, we consider uh, a system which comes from more prey predator. It's the Leslie uh, Gower, but uh, we changed it so it's in between Fitsugna Gumo and uh, 
Leslie Gower. And so we were able to, to mimic some properties of the GE and GI. And so by putting some stochastics inside, uh, you retrieve, you can retrieve the spectral properties of uh, that you, you observe in, in neuroscience and the GE and GI uh, correlation. Okay. Okay, so, so now I need to say more. I, of course, I already said, uh, spoke a, uh, a little bit of neuroscience context, but I want to be more specific on, on two things uh, for the remaining part of the talk. So this is Hodgkin Oxley, so 1963 uh, Nobel Prize Physiology and Medicine. And half after that, so Fitzhugh uh, wanted to propose a two-dimensional ODE system able to capture excitability and oscillatory behavior. And I mentioned that uh, because that's really what we wanted to do, and that's two important things that are present in Hodgkin, actually. And I, I'm going to use that after. And particularly now, I'm considering this PDE. So this is a kind of Fitzhugh-Nagumo, and you add the Laplacian on the first equation. And here, you let C depend on X. So that's why my question a little bit come from, uh, I, I answered to Arno. Uh, so here you have inhomogeneity in the space. So C depends on X and you can put in there the oscillatory and excitatory behavior. So oscillatory uh, will oscillate, and if you have excitable cells, they will propagate the waves or not, depending on the value of C. All right. So here is, is an example that I have shown before to Vitaly, actually. And here uh, the C is cooked up, but it only uses the fact that C may either propagate or no, or not the signal. And you, you get this kind of... Uh, is behavior that may be used uh, to represent some realistic uh, observations in uh, excitable tissue. All right. And so uh, the, the section is called synchronization of patterns in networks because uh, we can synchronize those kind of patterns that I showed just show, showed you. And uh, so instead of considering one ODE as in the previous network, you can consider PDEs and you can consider uh, those PDEs. And uh, this uh, slide shows that we were able a couple of years ago uh, to uh, reproduce, there are some laws which are known in ODE's network on ODE's. For example, for a given topology, the onset of synchronization follows an inverse law. And so what the PhD student uh, did, which he, he is now, uh, uh, he has uh, assistant professor in Vietnam, is that we, we, we recover the same laws, but for the PDEs and this, uh, his, much more richer because uh, you can synchronize patterns, okay? And so you can see here the inverse law for uh, these fully, fully connected networks. And you can do it both theoretically and numerically. All right, here is just the error of synchronization. So as you can see here, these two nodes, this is, those are two nodes, they're not the same. But when you increase the one of the parameters here, then uh, you get synchronization. So uh, 
I have to correct this slide. It's the second time. Uh, uh, there's an A here, which depends on the nonlinearity. So it's not one, it's an A. But uh, okay, forgive me about that. Okay. So let's go to the last uh, section. Oh, I'm running uh, late. Okay, so I will be quite fast. Uh, so now I, I want to give more details about that. So, so you consider non-homogeneity non, non here, the C may depend on X. And I want to discuss pattern formation. So first, let's consider the case C equals zero. So when you start to do simulations on that, and let's say you want to find those patterns, there are patterns out there, and you try to do that, well, you cannot find it. What you, what you will find, so uh, I'm not about, so I wanted to show this one first, but okay, that, that's not a big deal. So uh, when you when you try to do some simulations, you will you will uh, fall into the the simulation in the in the center. I mean, this attracts a lot of initial conditions. And you, if you want to find the patterns with this C equals zero, there's no homogeneity here on the parameter. You have to choose specific solutions, initial conditions to get those patterns. Okay. And uh, so, as you can see here, um, what I represented here, it's in blue. You have the mean. So what I represent is it's u as a function of x and the time evolves. And when you look at the integral of u in the left case and in the so in the left case it's zero, while in the right case it's not zero but uh, it's it's very small. And when you reach uh, homogeneity in the solution in space, well of course the the mean value is the same. Uh, this is actually the solution of the ODE. But um, so with that, you can actually find, uh, you can actually prove that you can ensure that some initial conditions will not go through the uh, homogeneous solution in space, which attracts the, 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 the wall, almost the, the wall set of initial conditions. And this is the theorem. So uh, you can ensure that you are not going through towards the homogeneous solution in space. So I have how many time I have. Uh, yeah. All right. So for example, so this theorem uses symmetry and it proves that if you start with a, a specific set of initial conditions, then your integral is zero. That was the case in the spiral type uh, pattern. And, and, and then you cannot go towards the homogeneous solution in, in space because the homogeneous solution in space has, has the same mean as the ODE, and the ODE is a periodic solution which is not zero. Okay, and, and the last thing that I wanted to talk about, it's uh, the non-homogeneity in space. And that was my question to Arno again, it's related to that. So at left, uh, if C equals zero, you have uh, the, if C equals zero at right, you have a, a limit cycle, and at left, you go towards a stationary solution. And mixing up the two, you can propagate or not your signal. So I have played with the C0, but you can play also with the size of, of the, the region at which it's zero. OK, but here I played with the, the C node. And so again, this I already showed you. And 
we can do more math by considering a toy model, but I think I'm I'm running late. So uh, so just to say that considering with this this uh, this uh, toy model, uh, which has some difficulties because the the spectrum of the linear operator uh, has zero as a as a limit as a the subsequence of the spectrum as zero as limit, but uh, so you, you can work on the L2 setting. I use L2 because then you can split the L2 within the again uh, subspaces. And so you can prove that. So it's not trivial because of the spectrum which which approximates zero, but you can prove that with the Lassalle principle. And uh, so this is uh, the same stuff for the ODE. And so this is the eigenvalues of the linear system. So they approximate zero with this one. And you have a cascade of bifurcation. I, I'm, I'm already done. If uh, Or I can directly switch to the end if you want. I, I don't know. And, well, uh, yeah. well, you have one minute more, please. OK, OK. And um, and you can prove even if alpha becomes positive, you can still find solutions that are going to zero, all right? And you have also a more uh, general theorem, and uh, you can prove that if you start, uh, it's a, a, a local stability theorem, and you are going to either uh, you can go to a periodic solution, or it depends on the the projection on the first subspace. All right, and so the proof uh, relies on the estimates here. And okay, basically I'm done. So this is the propagation or not of the signal in 1D, and you can generalize that with a C, which depends on leaks. You can generalize ideas of the toy model uh, to get uh, those results. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Benjamin. I really like all this patterns and synchronization because we lot uh, we work uh, a lot on this uh, neuroscience problems, and there are many many open questions. Unfortunately, we have very limited time to discuss, but I cannot resist to ask you just one or two short questions. In the first part, in the first part of your talk, uh, when you presented these discrete models, meaning these couple systems, big systems of ordinary different. Yes, actual equations. Uh, so uh, and with the uh, this network properties. So how this results depends on this network, on the geometry of this network, on this geometry of these connections between different nodes. Oh yes, yeah, I did. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't speak about that. So this is inspired by these previous uh, works that are inspired by real data. And so it's a, it's a stochastic, meaning that uh, for each, for example, for each, there are, there are two kinds of neurons, excitatory and inhibitory. And so for each inhibitory, you pick up randomly inhibitory neurons and excitatory neurons, and it's written right there. So there is... Uh, uh, so, uh, so, so, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's the idea. So this is random, but then the parameter is the density of these connections, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's uh, it's it's more simple than that. For so you pick, you say that each, for example, for each e neuron, you will pick up fifty e neurons randomly among the e neurons, mm -hmm. and for each i neuron, you will pick up. 190 excitatory neurons, etc. Right. Yes. But well, what is very sorry? What is very important, and of course we need to return to this question later, that in reality this connection is not random, but there are some special places, in particular called epicenters, connected to some very specific geometry. But okay. Yeah. But my but another question which i'd like to ask right now so in the same model which you showed now it explained now 
can you have a uh, spatial structure not only time oscillations but uh, uh, spatial temporal pattern and behavior in this model yeah of course we did not consider here that but in other works uh, without stochastic we considered yes and so yeah you have these wave propagations and uh yeah, yeah, of course, the Hodgkin actually, actually, it has the space in, in it. But here we don't consider it. But yes, you, you, you can also have Well, that. I mean, I mean, space not exactly the same, ah. the same meaning. The space is different, different parts of your network fire at different times. Yes, yes, yes. You have that. You have that. So here, yeah, I did not consider that. You, I, I, we, we look at that. But we we not delve into that. It was uh, another work to do. Yeah, you have that. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I understand your question. Thank you very much. It was. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much again, and we will certainly return to these questions. Now we have to finish the session. Uh, I would like to thank all speakers. Uh, and uh, also to recall you that we return back one hour later after the break to our last plenary uh, lecture and uh, session. So I see you later. Bye for now.